was a blue flame coming from his, in, from his, his stomach, about four inch slit in his stomach. And it was making a noise like a blow lamp. Bzzz. Did this fireman witness a case of spontaneous human combustion? For more than 40 years, this American physician has been trying to discover the truth about his mother's death. How was Mary Risa reduced to ashes? This log cabin remained unsinged while inside a retired fireman was consumed by flames. Was George Mott also a case of spontaneous human combustion? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, author of 2001 and inventor of the communications satellite. Now in retreat in Sri Lanka, he ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. There's one mystery I'm asked about more than any other, spontaneous human combustion. Fires, of course, are all too common, but occasionally brigades like this one near my home in Colombo are called out to deal with cases which baffle even the experts. Apparently, for no reason, people have suddenly burst into flames. Their bodies are almost totally consumed, yet, amazingly, their surroundings are barely singed. When I first investigated spontaneous human combustion, the explanations seemed even more fantastic than the facts. However, new evidence has now emerged, so I'm returning rather reluctantly to this most gruesome of mysteries. And it still is a mystery. Uh, we talk about the case today just like we did uh, 20 years ago uh, when I first started and even in 1951 when the incident occurred. A great deal of speculation, a great deal of uh, conjecture. Everybody has an angle, but nobody has the answer. The bizarre death of this man's mother has kept Florida talking for 40 years. In the bedroom of her wooden bungalow, on that fateful summer night in 1951, Mary Risa kissed her son Richard goodbye. To the young physician, everything seemed normal. Uh, at 8 o'clock, I remember the landlady who uh, called me and said that there had been a terrible accident. She didn't go into details and that I was to come right down. And across the way, when we came down, there were painters painting the house across the street. Then they were totally unaware that anything had happened in the apartment. I was prevented from going in the room by, I believe, the fire chief, who said I, that I shouldn't see what is inside. So I, I, didn't, I didn't go in. Of course, I later saw what it was. Uh, what the picture was uh, from, from photographs and descriptions. My recollection is that I entered the apartment at the fire scene with a hand pump, which is a small tank of water that is maneuverable by hand uh, for in interior extinguishment. And uh, noticing a pile of debris in the center of the room, I started to squirt it and was stopped immediately by other people who had preceded me into the room. It turns out that it was uh, not just debris, but part of a, uh, a corpse the, uh, of the lady who had been burned to death, unbeknownst to me. It was just her foot in a, in a shoe. It was uh, all that I recall seeing ever there. It was uh, an incredible, uh, un unexplainable thing to me then and is still now. She was consumed almost completely, uh, just what remained was a heel of, a, of her left foot and uh, just a piece of the skull, plus a little ash, the remains of her body. Everything had been consumed 
the room was covered with a sort of a smoky, oily ash up to the level of about four feet completely around. Uh, but that was, that was it. The uh, bed that had been turned down was undisturbed and ready as if it were ready to, uh, uh, to be slept in. And the clock that was nearby uh, had stopped running at about 4.20 in the morning. I believe Miss Reeser was known uh, to be a smoker, so there was some speculation that possibly she dozed off or dropped a cigarette on her clothing, which initially started the fire. But that still doesn't speak to how this total consumption occurred. Um, we have had many, many cases where people have fallen asleep uh, smoking, burned their clothes, in fact burned themselves, and unfortunately succumbed to the fire, but never anything like this. Uh, I believe there probably was some type of external ignition source. Now, what that was, I couldn't begin to speculate. Um, but I think, in my mind, what happened, Miss Reeser's body began to burn much like when we cook food. And you can essentially cook food down to nothing by applying the proper amounts of heat over the proper period of time. Um, unusual as that may seem, I think, the human body in this case actually became a fuel for fire as opposed to uh, just the recipient of heat-related injury. The possibility of it being a, a spontaneous combustion uh, arose and was written. Uh, even all, we're, all kinds of theories were uh, brought out, such as even lightning that came through a, an open window. Um, but uh, there was nothing concrete. And the fire, fire people here uh, had no explanation for it. No one had any explanation. And I, in looking back, I, I just think that no one ever knows how uh, a person of her size and weight, I judge she, she weighed about 170 pounds, uh, could be so totally uh, consumed. Uh, by a, by a fire that only uh, that only involved a, a portion of her room, the chair, which was uh, for, of course completely burned. All that was left were some springs that were found near the ashes of her body. Yes. Like Richard Reesa, this man Jack Stacy is still gripped by a fire from the past. On this spot in Lambeth, South London, stood Auckland Street, the scene of the strangest sight of his 30 years as a fireman. The memory has brought him back to search the records at the Fire Brigades Museum. Uh, we got the call at about uh, 20 past five in the morning. And uh, when we arrived, um, two or three minutes down the, down the embankment, there were about uh, half a dozen office cleaners outside this derelict building. And uh, they were pointing to the first floor and said, uh, we think there's a fire in there. And sure enough, there was a, a flickering blue flame coming from the upstairs window. Well, when we got up the ladder to the, onto the first floor, there was a, a body, man's body lying on the stairs. And uh, there was a blue flame coming from his, in, from his, his stomach about four inch slit in his stomach and it was making a noise like a blow lamp. Bzzz. And it was about eight inches long. That was the first thing we saw. A man came up the ladder with the hose reel and we actually put the hose reel inside the man's body. It was actually, he was burning from the inside out. It was the most bizarre um, thing I've ever seen at a fire. I think this is why I remember it so vividly. I've seen bodies in fires before but uh, you always, uh, we've always been able to say this happened or that happened or we know how this started, but this one, I'm afraid we didn't know. And we still don't know. And the cause of the fire is still unknown. The official cause of death by the coroner was the inhalation of fire fumes, suffocation due to inhalation of fire fumes. <laughs> I have my doubts about that. I have my doubts about that. 
I think it is a, one of these uh, human uh, spontaneous combustion mysteries, which I, we'll never solve at the moment. The moment the fire starts, the evidence is destroyed. Firemen are used to things igniting spontaneously. For example, haystacks can generate enough heat by fermentation to catch fire. And I've even heard of a case in Britain of a laundry which was raised to the ground when a pile of very dirty washing apparently went up in smoke on its own accord. But people spontaneously combusting is quite another matter. In earlier centuries, that old scapegoat, alcohol, was blamed by investigators and popular novelists. The idea of spontaneous human combustion fascinated the Victorians. In Bleak House, Charles Dickens chose it to dispose of a troublesome character. Popular belief linked the phenomenon with excessive drinking, and improving texts warned drunks that they ran the risk of spontaneous combustion. Serious research was scarce. One sober report from Dr. Mackenzie Booth in Aberdeen, Scotland, couldn't explain how a soldier was found burned up in a hayloft, yet straw inches away was untouched by the flames. Despite increasingly lurid reports, science stood back until the 1960s. Professor David G, then a young pathologist, was called in to investigate the mysterious death of an old person. She had fallen in the grate and been reduced to a pile of ashes. She had burned almost completely. Only a fragment of flesh and bone remained. Professor G wanted to discover how this could have happened. He published an account of his audacious experiment. I thought if I made a model that in one sense reproduced a body by using a glass test tube which would provide a sort of central firmness and then wrapping it around with some uh, human fat uh, and then putting around that a number of layers of, of cloth, uh, perhaps five or six layers to reproduce several different layers of clothing and ignited one end of it with a, a gas Bunsen burner. Uh, it then burnt uh, with a rather smoky flame um, and it took about three quarters of an hour to burn down about six inches of model and what was left was a, a very blackened uh, charred remains that looked very similar to the the body that I had been examining that it was like a candle only instead of having as candles do a wick down the middle with the wax on the outside um, this was really um, a candle with a wick on the outside and the combustible material on the inside Today, Dr. Siva Loganathan leaves his local butchers with a bag full of pork. It's the material he needs to carry on experimenting where Professor G left off. The question Dr. Siva wants to solve is, why do the victim's surroundings not burn as they do? I've taken some pork with a little muscle and some fat. I've rolled it in, uh, into a cylinder and then covered it with a cloth. Now, the idea being that the rolled up uh, piece of meat would represent uh, a human body, and the cloth would then represent the clothing on it. Uh, when the fat melts, it would then soak into the, the cloth, and then that would continue to burn exactly like a candle, excepting in this case, the wick is on the outside of the fat as opposed to being in the middle. The bodies are found burnt and almost ashed, with very little burning in the surroundings. And perhaps a little bit of the leg is left behind with almost a, a, a fairly well-marked uh, line of dem demarcation. We want to know why the rest of the surroundings didn't go up in flames. We want to know why uh, this progressive burning occurred. And this gives you as a fairly good working model as to how this whole process occurs, the slowness of the process, the, uh, the, the lack of violence of the flames, uh, proves to us that this is uh, quite a feasible explanation for this uh, phenomenon. I think essentially you'll find that when the body is burned in this sort of situation, it is only the melted fat that's burning. And therefore the melted fat most 
likely would continue to burn just about this same sort of level. So the flames are not splurting out all over the place. It is fairly well localized to a few inches around the body. That's what's happened. That's the skewer that I'm keeping in order to keep it, keep it uh, stiff. I don't think there's anything miraculous about it at all. It, I think, is perfectly uh, logically explainable. So this experiment just shows that it is possible. I've, I haven't really done a complete body, but this is the principle by which this whole phenomenon occurs. From the British Medical Journal comes a further clue in a report on a stomach operation by Jonathan Earnshaw. He was using electrical cutting equipment. And when I opened the stomach with the electro cautery device, there was an explosion and the, uh, the gaseous contents of his stomach ignited and splattered stomach contents all over the ceiling light and, uh, and on those who were surrounding the operating table. It was all rather frightening at the time. And there was a blue flame and a, and a sort of thump. And in fact, the, the flame lasted for a second or two and then stopped. As you can imagine, it's a pretty frightening sort of thing to happen to you when, the, when a patient explodes on the operating table and uh, there was a stunned silence initially and we then checked and we checked the patient, we checked all his vital signs and we checked the, uh, the inside of the stomach but in fact because the, the gases had been coming out of the stomach under pressure when they'd ignited fortunately there was no damage to the patient and we carried on with the operation and, uh, and the patient did very well afterwards but when we published this paper in the British Medical Journal I then got a, a whole sheaf of letters from other doctors particularly elderly doctors uh, who'd seen this occurrence on several occasions in the past. And there are some lovely letters here from, uh, from surgeons and GPs, uh, uh, from a soldier who was under my care in 1941 who was rude enough to belch whilst lighting a cigarette and the resulting flash and explosion seriously disturbed his comrades. So obviously it's, it's like a lot of things in medicine. We were only rediscovering what uh, people had known about in the past. Organisms can proliferate and produce methane, which is obviously flammable. If you then ignite it with a spark like I did, then that's not spontaneous combustion, that's ordinary combustion. John Hamer developed his own theory about spontaneous human combustion while he was scenes of crime officer with Gwent Police in Wales. Two deaths, only three weeks and 15 miles apart, inspired him. It was the coincidence of the two cases that got me really going. You had the same pile of ashes, the burning was the same, and the burn line went straight across from one leg to the other. That's what got me interested and started me on actually investigating other cases. In the first case in January 1980 at Ebu Vale, Sergeant Terry Russell was called to a house where a 73-year-old man had died in a fire. My immediate thoughts on seeing the deceased was that this was not an ordinary death. There was no external damage. There were no windows broken. We entered the living room of the premises. It was a sight that will never, ever really leave me. I found it totally fascinating. Although to the relatives, it must have been really devastating and gruesome. Well, as you see, here is a sketch I made just after the event actually, which shows the lack of damage to other materials in the room. This was the remains of a 73-year-old man who had been reduced to ash on the floor of his living room. A pair of glasses were lying on the edge of the grate, totally undamaged and perfectly clean. The fire was out in the grate, the dead coals tidy. I had heard the term spontaneous human combustion, but never really given it much thought. Having seen the sight that I saw on that day, I now believe that this kind of thing is a possibility. And there's certainly some questions which haven't been answered to my satisfaction in relation to that death. The next case, only 27 days later, came at Newport, the county town. This time, an old woman had died. Inspector Colin Durham investigated. There was a report of uh, fatality as a result of uh, fire at a house here in Corporation Road. And this poor old lady 
she was reduced to ashes, except for two lower parts of the, both legs. Uh, and, uh, well, this was amazing to me, to see a body in such a condition. The most abnormal thing about it was that there was nothing in the room damaged. There's no doubt that it was a case of a human body catching fire, and it was called spontaneous human combustion. I have no doubt at all. But I eventually started thinking about it, and the difficulty was that you have bodies laden with water. The average ten stone body contains 10 gallons of water being reduced to ashes in circumstances where normal combustible materials cease to burn. Now, that is an impossibility, but it happened. I realized that the water must be the source of the fuel. John Hamer believes that by some as yet unknown alchemy, water in the body can be split into oxygen and hydrogen to concoct a highly flammable mixture. Now, hydrogen burning in oxygen burns with a fierce blue flame and will cut through steel, and steel melts at 1,500 degrees centigrade. Now, that sort of flame could indeed reduce a corpse to ashes without releasing enough oxygen to sustain burning elsewhere in the room, and it would also explain the lack of water. Now, I have no belief in spontaneous human combustion as a paranormal or supernatural event. It is an entirely natural event the mechanism of which we do not yet understand. The scientists' rather stomach-churning experiments show that most of these cases do have a rational explanation. There's usually some source of ignition near the victim, perhaps a cigarette or a faulty electrical appliance. Yet some cases still seem to defy explanation and leave me with a creepy and very unscientific feeling. If there's anything more to SHC, I simply don't want to know. In Ticonderoga in New York, the men of the Volunteer Fire Brigade are still baffled by the untimely death of one of their number. George Mott was a non-smoker, famously cautious about fire. Yet he burned to nothing in his log cabin in the woods in 1986. Kendall Mott used to get a call from his father every day. When the phone didn't ring, Kendall went to check on him. The door handle was warm when I grabbed the door handle. And it was unlocked. So I knew, you know, right then, I could, I opened the door, I could tell it wasn't. The whole inside of the house was black. Of course, there's no lights because electricity was out, you know, it'd burn out. So I left, I knew something, you know, it happened, but you couldn't see anything. And we went and called the state troopers, Nickel Valley come down. The first room that we walked into was uh, nothing too much out of the ordinary other than I couldn't help but notice uh, as I looked around that the, that the walls were uh, uh, slightly brownish colored. Uh, it appeared that uh, the place had been subjected to intense heat. The TV was melted, you know, the guns on the wall were all charred, the refrigerator was all black, all, everything was black, it was just like it had really been, heat, you know, hot, but hadn't quite burnt, you know. In the bedroom itself, uh, there was a single bed with uh, a dresser adjacent to it, as I remember. Um, and the, the mattress had been burned through. Uh, and the floor, which was wooden structure, uh, below the bed was, was burned through and there were some fragments of bones and possibly a skull, as I remember, uh, lying on the floor beneath the bed. He hadn't smoked for quite a while, and there was a sign on the door that said no smoking in the house, so, because he, had, he lost the use of one of his lungs a long time ago. Yeah, you know, all the signs indicated that there had been an extreme amount of heat, but nothing had caused uh, anything to ignite. Uh, and the only thing that had burned itself, you know, was uh, George Mott's body. There was the, the, uh, the theory of the, the spontaneous combustion theory that uh, possibly the body may have uh, ignited itself uh, for whatever reason and uh, consumed itself uh, through extreme heat. Uh, other than that, 
uh, putting that aside, I don't think that there's that there are too many other uh, plausible explanations for it that I can think of. Well, he was a fireman for quite a while. He's pretty picky as to, you know, let, leaving things around, you know. But I don't know. I don't think it was fire. I just think it was, like they said, spontaneous combustion. I don't see any other answer for it. Thank you.